Hi, and um, welcome to what I think is lecture 33 at this point. And in this one, I'm going to talk about color. And compared to the last lecture on interferometers, which was very mathematical um, at times, today I think we're going to leave it entirely conceptual. So before you, you can see the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So um, all the electromagnetic waves are ultimately the same. Right? The electric and magnetic fields that are oscillating, they're oscillating together. Um, so when the electric field is the maximum, the magnetic field is the maximum, and and so on. If you understand what those are, that doesn't change with frequency or wavelength. But you can have all sorts of frequencies and wavelengths. And just sort of showing them all here, that's what you mean by the electromagnetic spectrum. So in this plot here, long wavelengths are on the right, short wavelengths are on the left, right? So here's 10 to the zero, that is one meter. That's what happens where about FM radio waves um, happen. So if you listen to FM radio, the radio waves are gonna be, be between one meter, two meters, something like that, 10 meters, but not hundreds of meters and not millimeters. Um, AM waves, they're, they're a bit longer. They tend to also have lower um, frequencies as a result. Right, this is 10 to the eight, it's 100 um, megahertz. You might listen to 95.7 megahertz, for example. The AM ones um, tend to be in the, uh, have a, you know, a lot lower frequency. And then you put all those other ones. We've got um, gamma rays down here. Those are those with really, really short wavelengths in the femto and atometer range, really tiny. X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, because in the micrometer um, range. And then those really long wavelength, long radio waves over here that have very few, I think, actual uses in terms of, sort of practical life, but um, a lot of astronomy, like radio wave astronomy, might happen at some of those really long wavelengths. And technically, this graph could extend further to the left, further to the right, never end. Um, but in practice, we don't observe, you know, super, super high gamma rays beyond what's about shown here, or um, radio waves, the longer wavelengths than what's shown here. Now, squished in all of this, there's the visible spectrum. So here you see the different colors. It's uh, made bigger here. And in all the pictures we're going to be looking at are either taken from the Wikimedia Commons or the, um, I think, Encyclopedia Britannica. I've got a few that I pulled up. I tried to draw this out initially, um, but it was just way messier than any, than, you know, most pictures I could find. So I want to do it by those pictures that other people have drawn for us. So you can very nicely see um, the visible spectrum. Right, so that all the colors that you see here, well, is it? We'll talk about that in a second. And our visible range is something like low 400s to around 700 nanometers. Right, so these are only nanometers, those values that you can see here. And then anything above about 620 is red, um, between 590 and 600 is orange, and so on. Yellow, green, blue, violet. Of course, it's a smooth transition. There are no hard boundaries. The same thing up here. These lines, they're, they're not sort of strict, right? People would argue how far does UV go? When do X-rays start? I don't think it's well defined. Um, same thing here. Where does green start and yellow begin? Around 570, but, you know, maybe 566. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. Right? It's, it's a continuous spectrum. So... Then those are all the colors we might, that we might call the colors of the rainbow. So if I send you a sine wave, right? An electromagnetic wave is a sinusoidal shape with wavelength 570 nanometers, you'd see this color is sort of yellowish green. If I send you a sinusoidal wave that is 450 nanometers in wavelength, well, you'd see this sort of very dark, almost violet blue and so on. Now, if you look at white light, and you go to analyze it, it is not a sinusoidal wave. It is a sum of sinusoidal waves. The same way when we listen to a violin, 
right? We hear a certain note. It's not just one sine wave. That would be this of pure tone that you get from a tone generator. It's it's a sum of sine waves of different frequencies. And the same thing is true with white light. So when you look at white light, it's often said that you know you see like all the colors are mixed together, and it's sort of true. There, but you should think of it as there's a red ray hitting me and a yellow ray and a green ray at the same time. Right? That is not there's only one value for the electric and magnetic field. It's only one wave, but that wave is a complicated shape, much like the um, the the sound wave of a violin is a complicated shape. It's not a sine wave. But you can express it as a sum of sine waves, and in the case of white light, it would be the sum of you know 450, maybe 451, 456, you know all sorts of essentially all the different frequencies. And then you can split them up. And the way you do this is you use a prism. So I've got a picture here, a beautiful picture, again much nicer than I could ever draw it. Um, you send a white light ray in. And then it hits the surface at an angle and it refracts, right? We understand refraction. You can do the calculation if you know the index of refraction. Now, what happens is that the index of refraction actually ever so slightly depends on the wavelength itself. So it's not the same, same material, but it's not the same for red light as it is for blue light. And it's going to be very different for, say, radio wave or gamma rays. Right, and so this small difference—it might be, you know, one point five one for red light and one point five four for blue light. And the higher frequencies, the shorter wavelengths, tend to have the higher index of refraction. So in this picture, you can see that the the violet um, part of the 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 light is refracting more; like it's bending more than the red one. Uh, so this small difference in the refractive index causes the light to split up, right? This mixed wave arrives, but and you can prove this mathematically, ultimately. You can write it mathematically as a sum of the different sine waves, and each sine wave is going to act a little bit different. Again, it's complicated calculation, but essentially you solve the, the wave equation for light on a boundary. Same thing happens over here. Here they just bend, bend more as they come out. If I had two parallel surfaces, the light, ray, the light rays would bend back and go in the original direction, and um, you know, but they'd be split up into red, yellow, and so on because they'd be in slightly different positions. That said, if you had a really broad beam coming in, right, and then the light got refracted, and then there was a surface on the other side that had the same orientation as the one on the left, then all the lights would light would come back out and mix back together, you'd again see white, which is what happens when you look through a window, for example, where you don't see the splitting up of colors because there's not just one beam of light coming in. Um, and so it works better if you've got two surfaces that are not at the same angle, because then it bends a second time, maybe in the same direction as before, and you get a broader spread of the colors. So th this we call a prism, like any transparent object that does that is, is called a prism. Um, he, now, I put up a actual graph for different materials of the refractive index. It's drawn here on the, the y-axis against the wavelength. And this is in micrometers, so between about 0.4 to 0.7, so this orange part, that's the visible spectrum. And here it shows you graphs of the index of refraction against the wavelength for different types of essentially glass or glass-like substances like crown glass, um, flint glass, and they have different indices of refraction in the first place. For example, this lanthanum dense flint, you know, it's in the 1.8 something range, whereas the crown glass down here is in the 1.5 range. But also, you can very clearly see that as the wavelength gets bigger, the index of refraction of any one of them goes down. Right? And for example, let's take dense flint, SF10. I don't know exactly what it means. It's a type of transparent material. If we're at 0.3 something micrometers, so 300 and, I don't know, 50, oops, what did I do? Um, 350 nanometers, right here where the, the beige goes into the orangey, pinkish, weird colored one. Um, 
the index of refraction is 1.8. If you're looking at, say, um, yellow, reddish light at 0.6, orange maybe, um, it would be here, so it would be about 1.73. So a significant difference in the index of refraction. And that leads to the light refracting in different directions. Now, all right. So how do we pick those up, those colors? How do we see them? So in your eye, you've got four types of cells. And you may notice, you know, for different courses or just because, you know, you, you look at, at you know, if you read it somewhere. Um, we call those, well, the two types, broadly speaking, there's cones and there's rods. There's so one type of rod and three types of cones. Um, this is this are roughly the shape of those cells on your retina. And the rods, let's talk about those first, they just pick up light and you see, hey, there's something there. And they're extremely sensitive to any type of light. On this graph here, I have the wavelength again at the bottom, and you can see the different colors. And then you have the normalized absorbance. So we don't care about the values. What that means is it shows us at what, um, at what wavelength does each cell, each type of cell, absorb the most light. And when it absorbs light, it sends a signal to the brain. The more light it absorbs, the, the brighter our brain sort of sees the color as it were. So the rods are extremely sensitive. Now all those lines here, they're, they're made to be the same height. That's, that's why it's normalized. It means they're both the same level. It's not actually true. Some of them are inherently more sensitive than others. Like the rods are way more sensitive than the blue or the green and the red cones, right? So when it's dark, we really only see with our rods, which is why when it's dark, you don't really see color, but you still see. Um, so we're not very interested in those right now. We're going to look at the cones. And so we've got three types of cones, and they're sent differently sensitive to light at different wavelengths. Right? And so, for example, the so-called blue cones, not actually blue, but they're called blue cones because they're most sensitive to blue light, their maximum sensitivity is here, which means if I send you a, um, a light ray, a wave at 420 nanometers wavelength, your blue cone is going to fire up and send a big signal along the optic nerve to your brain right? at 420. That said, you can look, from, look at the other two and those graphs, they are not zero here. Right, there's still some values. So when I send you the 420 nanometer light, your blue cone is going to fire a big signal. Your green one and red one, they're, they're still going to fire something. They say, hey, I saw something, but not very bright. But the blue one says, I saw it very bright. And then your brain interprets that combination of signals as the color blue. Right, as this blue here. Now, if instead you send a, uh, you look at something that has, say, four 60 nanometers wavelengths. Sorry, five 60 nanometers wavelengths. That's somewhere here, right? Five 60. All right, so it's in the yellowish, on the greenish end of yellow. Right, you do this, and then who picks it up? Well, the blue one doesn't really at all. Right, the blue one has a sensitivity to lower wavelengths, and above about 500, it detects very little. And about 5.30, it detects pretty much nothing. So if you just had the blue cones, you would not be able to see the yellowish green light. But both the green ones and the red ones, they're fairly sensitive. So if I'm at 5.60, I can see the green one is about here, the red one here. So they both fire a signal to your brain. Now the red one's going to be a bit bigger. And so your brain knows to interpret this. I got green and red, but nothing from the blue. All right, that means... Um, we are in the yellowish range. If they both fired, but it got a little bit more green than red, you would probably know, hey, we are about in the in this greenish yellow range, like over here, more in the green side, as if you were at you know, 530 nanometers. If you were at 500 nanometers, and the light of at 500 nanometers wavelength hits your eye, your blue one's going to send this tiny little little squeak to your brain, like, oop, I saw something, I think, not much, but there was something. And the red one says, hey, I saw a significant amount of light. The green one says, hey, I saw a lot of light. And your brain puts the pieces together and says, ooh, it must be green. Right. So 
That's how your brain interprets any type of light that comes of a particular single wavelength. Right? It just it just all the all the different um, cells fire, or maybe not. If you're up here, the blue one won't fire, but but if you're down here, for most of the range, like this, in the sort of 400 to 500, they're all going to fire. If you're above 530, only the red and the green one, into different degrees and different combinations. And your brain knows to interpret it as one of those colors of the rainbow. So then some people, and um, this is a curiosity, some people have a fourth type. This is... Um, um, this is it, it's fairly rare, but it, it's a thing that that reoccurs. I think it's called something like tetrachromatic vision, and um, tetra being the Greek for number four, chromatic, referring to essentially the, the different colors, like every single color. So in that case, you might have has these ones here. Now these ones, the green one, the red one, they've got slightly different values here than in the other graph. I'm not entirely sure whether there's some variation from human to human or whether um, you know whether there's some uncertainty so um never mind that the principle is the same but then they have a fourth one and so they get to see a wider range of um of colors but let's go back to those ones another thing that can happen is that you're red green color blind in which case you have the blue ones instead of one red green mixed one or at least functioning well put it this way so that you can't really distinguish how much green or how much red got fired. You see, it's a combination of those two. That was a lot, a little of the blue. Um, so, what about what about other colors? What what about brown? What even about the sort of you know magenta, like red and you know, mix red and blue? What do you think happened when you mix red and blue? Like there's a smooth transition for our eyes from red to red to 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 blue. If you if you paint, you mix blue and red to make essentially purple and violet. So well, I could have light that is not just a single frequency that hitting me. I could have light that is that is a bit of four hundred nanometers, a bit of six hundred nanometers. Well, your brain says, "Oh, blue one's fired. Oh, red one's fired." So what you see is a color that is not strictly one of those the spectrum because it was not a sinusoidal wave. It fires. It causes your um, optical nerves to or your, your optical your cells your cones to fire um, in a combination that does not correspond to any single color here right so it could have a lot of blue a lot of red but not that much green that there's no point on the spectrum that would make that happen but if it's a mix of light that hits you a mix of pure colors like this then your brain interprets it in this case as say magenta. If you've got a wild mix of bit here, a bit there, something it might be brown. Or if you've got a sort of all colors together, or more or less all colors, you might see that more like it's white or gray if it's if it's not very strong. So, so other colors exist. To say they're not they don't exist, which is not sometimes hear people say it's just not true. They exist in your brain because in your brain color is a combination of how much of this, how much of this, and how much of this. Right? Some colors such as brown or white, they don't or magenta, they don't exist as a single frequency. But they they still exist like in your brain as a combination of the blue ones fired that much, the green ones fired, and you know, the blue ones fired at 100, the green ones fired at 80, the red ones fired at 70. You're like, what color is it? I don't know what that would be, how you would see that particular color. Um, probably some of the brown. But it's, it's, it's a color that's real. So, now we can exploit this. When you look at a computer screen, like you're probably doing right now, right? A computer screen creates blue color, blue light, green light, and red light. And that's it. So what a computer screen does, if I look at a single pixel on the screen, right? And I say I take a one um, down here, like this very pixel here you're looking at right now on your screen, sort of in the bluish, light blue range. Well, 
that particular color, you, you, the computer can't create it. Your screen can't create it. So what it does, it creates a certain amount of blue and a certain amount of green and red together in such a way that that combination prompts your brain to interpret that as, as this blue here. So your computer, so you tell your computer, I want to create the color that it corresponds to where I'm just holding my cursor right now. And then the, the screen creates light of a certain certain um, strength or certain intensity of blue, a slightly lower intensity of green, and even lower intensity of red. And your brain picks up those three and it thinks it sees this color blue here, but it doesn't. It sees a mix of this color, this color, and this color, which is a different wave. It's not a sine wave that is at 450 nanometers. It's a sine wave at 420 plus a sine wave at 430 plus a sine wave at 560, but with different amplitudes that fool the brain into thinking that it's seeing this color because it corresponds exactly to the intensity of this, this, and this in the right proportions. And when you, if you, you know, you, you do a, some, some, some works, when you design websites or whatever you do, you can manually you know choose colors you can you know go into go into word and create a new font or you pick a font and you pick a color and you can manually put in how much blue do i want how much green do i want how much how much red do i want maybe from 0 to 255 of blue 0 to 255 max of green 0 to 255 of red and 255 is just because it's convenient for a computer in the way um it stores data but what we're doing is you're deciding manually, okay, I want the blue cells in the eye to be stimulated that much, the green cells to be stimulated that much, the red ones to be stimulated that much. And depending what combination you pick, your brain picks it up as brown or magenta or green, right? So different ways to make, to make green. You could just use, you know, this and you could send a 520 nanometer wavelength or you could send a certain amount of 534 and the sum of 564 in the right proportions to fool your brain into thinking it's receiving light at 530 nanometers. It's a bit of a trick. Oh. All right, that's all I want to say about it. In the, in the near future, as our last sort of big topic, I think, on this course, we're going to talk about another um, implication of this effect here, um, which is rainbows and all sorts of other associated optical phenomena. Um, that happen as a result of refraction at different indices and a lot of geometry and interesting natural effects. I'll see you there.